I will never earn as much as my CEO. And that's not me being pessimistic or even hard on myself. I'm not even afraid to jinx myself here because the odds of me earning that much are so low. In 2020, the top 350 CEOs in the US made over $24 million on average. That means at my current salary, I'd have to work over, I don't know, 281 years to make what they made in one year. But it wasn't always like this. The CEO to worker pay gap has expanded exponentially over the past several decades. The Economic Policy Institute estimates that CEO compensation has grown 1,322% since 1978, while typical worker compensation has risen 18%. The Institute for Policy Studies estimates that 80% of S&P 500 companies pay their CEO over 100 times more than they pay their median worker. That means it would take 100 years for the average employee at one of those companies to earn what their CEO makes in one year. And if you're wondering, yes, that is physically impossible. This inequality is creating anxiety for families across the country and across the political spectrum. According to Pew, a majority of Americans think future generations will be financially worse off. These anxieties are founded on legitimate questions, like, will I be able to pay our bills this month? Can I give my kids a better life than I had? Is it possible to get ahead anymore? And even, Will billionaire CEOs abandon the planet and fly off to Mars? These questions are founded on my favorite question. What's next? My name is Abigail Johnson Hess. You can call me AJ. I'm a multimedia reporter for CNBC Make It, and I cover the changing ways people learn and work. And this is What's Next. Lawrence Mitchell is a distinguished fellow at the Economic Policy Institute. He's previously worked at places like the U.S. Department of Labor and Cornell University School of Industrial and Labor Relations. He is the go-to pro on the CEO to worker pay gap. And I recently gave him a call. Uh, hey, Lawrence, how are you? Great, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Do you prefer Larry or, or Lawrence? Uh, if you talk to me face to face, you have to use Larry. You know, I read your most recent report and there were three big things, kind of big numbers that like stood out to me and also terrified me. First one was that since 1978, CEO pay has increased 1,322%, but typical worker pay has increased just 18%. The second terrifying thing was that in 2020, CEOs were paid 351 times as much as a typical worker, and that the CEOs of the top 350 firms in the US were paid 24.2 million on average. How are you measuring these numbers? What what are these? What does that CEO compensation mean when we when we look at those numbers? That's a good question. Uh, CEO compensation in our study uh, reflects uh, wages, bonuses, long term incentives, but most importantly, the uh, stock options that a CEO has cashed in each year, as well as any vested stock awards. The EPI estimates that more than 80% of typical CEO compensation is stock related. So it's not all about their salary per se. What we're measuring is, is what they pay taxes on. And that's a nice way to say, you know, this is real. This is what they actually got, they took in. In the 1990s, CEO compensation took off as the stock market boomed. It is what you could call a Lake Wobegon market. Okay, pause. Here, Larry's making a reference to the NPR show Prairie Home Companion, which is set in the fictional town of Lake Wobegon, quote, where all the women are strong, all the men are good looking, and all the children are above average. Everyone thinks they're above average in this town. Okay, back to Larry. Firms believe that they're an important place and, and they want a, a great executive. And if you have a great executive, then they certainly should be paid above average. Now, if every firm decides that they're gonna pay their executive above average, and you look at what the pay of other executives are in firms similar to yours, and you make sure that it's more, over time, it just ratchets up and up and up and up. I have some natural skepticism here board members and shareholders must have reasons for wanting to pay CEOs more. There's this notion that the CEO compensation is tied to the stock market, so therefore the CEO is getting paid for performance because their pay goes up with the stock market. Not really so true. The measure of 
stock price that's incorporated into these performance pay is not whether the stock price of your firm rises more than the stock price of competitors. It's just if the stock price goes up. Now we have lots of things that make the stock market go up and things that have nothing to do with executive performance. You know, when Trump gave huge tax cuts to corporations, that was a lift to the stock market. CEOs made more money. It's not because of any performance. The other end of that kind of dynamic is that typical worker pay has only increased 18%. What are, what are some of the reasons for that? Wages and benefits have not grown very much in the last 40 years. It has grown far less than what the economy produced. If you look at a measure of productivity, net of depreciation, evaluated at consumer prices, if you look at sort of what workers could have received, it's more on the order of, uh, you know, 60%, okay? But they got 18%. Larry is referring to research that found worker productivity has increased 3.5 times faster than average worker pay since the 1970s. He also mentioned six potential reasons for sluggish wage growth. High unemployment, which forces workers into accepting the lowest wages possible. Globalization, which allows companies to find the cheapest workers in the world. The erosion of unions, which makes it harder for workers to collectively bargain. Low labor standards, including a low minimum wage. The increase in non-compete clauses, which makes it harder for workers to find better wages in their industry. And domestic outsourcing, like shifting to a workforce of freelancers. All of these things have occurred and are not efforts to make us more efficient and better, make a bigger economy. What they do is they weaken the individual and collective bargaining power of workers. And this has happened to the bottom 90%. I'm not talking about, you know, just low wage workers. This has happened throughout the bottom 90%. You noted that the CEOs now are making 351 times that of a typical worker. But back in 1978, it was only 31 times. In 1989, it was 61 times. And if the problem is so obvious, there should be some obvious solutions staring us in the eyes to help close this pay gap. I hope that something that is uh, believed that by all uh, people who um, believe in family values we should use which is shame. Shame is a useful concept, well, doc, well documented in every Bible. Do you think like hero CEOs could, could fix the, the solution or, or do you think that's kind of one drop in the bucket? I, I, you know, listen, you got to admire people like that. I think that's helpful, but I think it takes policy and it takes a, a collective approach to squelch um, the, the escalation of CEO compensation. And, and listen, I mean, the, the degree to which CEO compensation grew in the pandemic, as people were struggling and uh, people were laid off, is what else can you say other than shameful? What I'm about to say is unusual for me in my entire career as an economist, which is, you know, more than 40 years, that I identify that what the current administration and, and the Congress are doing seems to be centering the needs of workers to get ahead. The very first bill passed was the American Rescue Plan, which put us on a trajectory to have full employment by the uh, end of 2022. We're expecting unemployment to be three and a half percent in the fall of 2022. Uh, that's pretty good. He also references provisions in the reconciliation bill currently on the Hill that would create monetary penalties for companies that violate worker unions rights and a Biden executive order that asks the FTC to implement rules to limit or ban employers from forcing non-compete clauses on employees. I think we see policy trying to put the thumb on the scale for workers so as to give them a better balance relative to employers. Now, if workers are able to assert themselves and do assert themselves and reap results, that, that's gonna make it harder for the CEOs to rake it in. No raise, Mr. Bless Gravy, I quit. Today, workers are quitting their jobs at some of the highest rates in 20 years. The highest rates ever reported by the BLS. 
Nearly 4 million people quit their jobs in July 2021 alone. In this environment, which is mostly because the job openings have been growing at a substantial pace, even though we have high unemployment, which makes it that people can switch jobs and know they can switch jobs. And people have been given, you know, at least until recently, they've been given some unemployment benefits that are pretty decent. Now they're getting child tax credit. So it gives you a chance where you, where you can't be starved into submission. So yeah, it's going to be hard for restaurants which are trying to get away with a $9 an hour wage to get somebody. That's not a labor shortage. That's the market working. I also asked him about those billionaire CEOs building rockets to escape Earth. He cuts me off. One can only hope so. Do <laughs> you think that'll happen or, or are you just hoping it will? No, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. They're going to walk away from their billions of dollars. I mean, you know, what, to give it to their ex-wives? With that question answered, I returned to my first claim about never being able to make as much as my CEO. I wrote an article a, a while ago that looked at a study from the Institute for Policy Studies that said, you know, the average worker would have to work a uh, hundred years to make as much as a CEO makes in one year. Um, I went and looked at the numbers for my CEO, uh, Jeff Shell. Do you think I could ever make as much as uh, my CEO? Well, how well do you know the, um, you know, the board of directors?